Welcome back to Trials from the Glass Guarded World, where we join our patchwork pals amidst an unforeseen trial in which Paxton now faces judgment for crimes long past. His once friend, the con artist formerly known as Charles, has just asked that the trial begin. Will Paxton be condemned for the crimes of Frith? Will the Lumpins come to his rescue? What will happen to this miniseries if Paxton is executed? Will anyone even want to listen to a Dungeons and Dragons legal drama? Let's find out now. Dun dun! I completely forgot this one was going to be a courtroom drama. <laughs> Is that the Law and Order Donk Donk? Yeah, that was, that was the <laughs> Law and Order <laughs> Donk Donk. Executive produced by Dick Wolf. You can't use that sound; it's trademarked. <laughs> <laughs> Paxton, you stand in a grand arched hall before the Council of Two. The two high consuls stand imperiously above the rest at a raised table. You recognize the first high consul member, Consul Brennelfor, who imprisoned you the last time and who Aster impersonated in order to free you from prison. He is a tall elf with a thin mustache. He looks down at you with open scorn on his face. The other High Consul member also looks familiar to you. It is a slightly overweight, dark-haired elven woman. Uh, the reason you recognize her, actually, is because it was her face that Charles pretended to get a tattoo of on his cheek. <laughs> Behind them, at ground level, sits the 12 junior members of the Council. You recognize some faces from the last time you were here, but you don't know their names. Behind them stands two gigantic white bark trees, leaves of vibrant green, with branches interlaced which shroud the council and the rest of the hall. Behind you sits an audience of locals who have come to witness the proceedings. You hear them muttering and chittering amongst themselves. You have been led to a raised platform in front of the council. Your shackles remain and your clothing is still torn and mangled from your battle with the deep druids. Yet here you stand, facing their imperious gaze and facing their judgment. Standing next to you is Charles, who apparently is named Baron Bluefire. He is wearing a resplendent green cloak trimmed in gold around the edges. On his back, laced in gold, is the two-tree symbol of the City of Two. Charles has just proclaimed that the trial should begin. Uh, just to just to confirm, am I still covered in blood? You definitely have some blood stains on your on your robes. But not like dried blood on my face and stuff, right? No, no, no. You've okay. you've been allowed to bathe during the during the travels here. I don't. If you hadn't quite done the the heroic actions that you had, I don't know if he would have allowed you to wash out the blood. He might have made you keep it, but he he uh, seems to have changed his opinion of you, and he allowed you to kind of bathe and uh, present yourself a little bit better to the council than you would have. Didn't we have Napkin Lumpin until just recently? Because we talked about having him use prestidigitation to clean him up. Oh, that's a good point. All right, I'm going to retcon that then. So you, so you, your, your little underclothes are pristine for some reason. Charles has just asked that the trial begin. Uh, before he says that, the female elf consul, she stands up from her seat at the high table. And she rises and says... Due to the personal nature of the trial and the accused, I will be recusing myself. Consul Brennifor, you have full jurisdiction. And she goes and she actually takes a seat to the side of the chamber. Brennifor, he stands up and he says, Thank you, Consul Bluefire. Although I appreciate your gusto, Cloak Bluefire, due process must still be followed. We have our accuser. Are there any who wish to act as defenders of the accused? And he looks around the room. We're in the room with him, right? Um, I guess I'll wait. <laughs> yeah. so, I was about to say, all right, none, none of the offer. Yeah. I'm didn't, uh, didn't the guard say he would act as, his, as uh, Paxton's defense? He said he would act as a witness if you needed uh, him. He, he's in the crowd now, but he hasn't said anything yet. All right. I nudge Iron Lumpen, too. <laughs> yep. I take out my axes and say, I'll, I will, I will help defend. I just kind of hold them up, displaying them. Uh, Brennel four kind of looks at you with a very patronizing look and he says, very well. Any others besides, uh, these two little rag people? I'm lumping. 
Thank you, Lumpen. Paxton puts his head in his hands and just mutters, I'm going to (laughs) die. Frith, you seem to be in good hands. And he, uh, and so then he, he turns and uh, he raises his hands. He says, very well. We will begin with opening remarks. Afterwards, we will take a recess and you will be able to submit a request for any evidence or witnesses to be included in the trial. Do you understand? You asking me? What's a trial? He's asking the Lumpins if they understand that they're going to give opening remarks and then they're going to take a recess where if you want any witnesses or evidence to be submitted, you're going to have to do it during the recess. Iron Lumpin holds up his hand. I understand, but can you explain trial, (laughs) recess, evidence, and witness? I cannot. Cloak Bluefire, you may proceed. Okay, we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to warn you guys, this, this episode is going to be a lot of me talking to myself, unfortunately. <laughs> but also, I do want to say before we begin that this isn't decided. So you guys have the complete opportunity to change the results of this trial. So <laughs> keep that in mind that none of this is set in stone. Whatever happens will be actually within your hands, your little cloth and hands. <laughs> Charles, who you now known to be known as Baron Bluefire, he stands up. He turns to the crowd and then kind of starts pacing back and forth in the hall. And he says, As Golgor Greftika's law states, there is no such thing as a free spell. Every choice has a cost. The cost of destruction and murder is justice. Today... Let us see that cost repaid. While the council is aware of who I am, my name is Varen Bluefire. My mother is High Council Alara Bluefire, and my father was Chief Investigator Kilwin Bluefire. I am a green cloak in service to the City of Two. I have spent the last several years tracking the accused, Frith, and was the one ultimately responsible for his capture. I need not remind the council of the crimes of Frith, but as the accused has continually argued that his amnesia, and he pulls up his fingers as like in quotes, prevents him from recalling his previous crimes, and it's worth bringing up why he stands before us today. Frith first came to the council's attention when he orchestrated several attacks on the council by observers, coming up with ridiculous reasons to trick his fellow observers into attacking. These ranged from the council members are doppelgangers to their werewolves. So even though he instigated these attacks, He would then anonymously warn the council of those attacks before they transpired, in an attempt to create a massacre of both the council and the observers. Unfortunately, his attempts were successful, leading to the mass deaths of observers. It took far too long before it was finally discovered that Frith was the one behind those attacks. Very few observers were still alive. I need not remind the council of my father, Kilwin Bluefire, who is well known by this city. He was an elf who was the founder of the Green Cloaks, the defender of the Second Battle of Arrival, the hero of the Battle of Aldeport, an elf noble by birth who was offered the position of High Consul, but refused in order to more directly serve the people. As he brings this up, you see uh, Consul Brennifor, his nostrils kind of flare. He seems a little bit annoyed about being reminded that he was second choice for High Consul. Baron continues, and he says, It was at this point that my father began to hunt down Frith. My father, along with ten of his best green cloaks, were able to track Frith all the way to the Free Cities. Once there, they were able to find one of his hideouts, which was located in a series of caverns. As they attempted to infiltrate and capture him, Frith triggered a cave-in that crushed and killed my father, along with all of his men. Frith was able to escape afterwards, taking on the name Paxton, and then attempting to remain anonymous. He was not seen again until he arrived here several months ago, and then subsequently broke out of prison in an attempt to escape trial. He is now once again in our grasp, and I beg the council to not delay in meeting out the punishment that is many times overdue. Frith Paxton is a fearmonger, an orchestrator of massive death and violence, and himself a murderer. Following me, You will hear from several witnesses who will attest to these facts and who will prove that the accused is worthy to receive the full extent of punitive justice. He finishes and he steps away and Brennelfor nods his head in agreement as Varen finishes his remarks. 
After a moment's silence, he turns to the Lumpens. Defenders, please present your opening remarks. I, uh... Adjust a pair of glasses that I didn't have before, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they are sitting nicely on my brand new nose, which uh, on Fancy Napkin Lumpen had sewed for me. And I shuffle some papers, which uh, also you had no idea where they came from. <laughs> Counselor Brennifor, I didn't know Paxton when he was called Frith. But as far as I understand, he's not Frith anymore. He's a different person. And the person he is now is a really good friend and a really cool guy. I've been writing down the things that he's taught me. And I fish out my notebook with the Gospel of Paxton uh, from within my cloth folds. Uh, Here are some of the things. You should always try to help people who are less fortunate than you. You should save people when they're in trouble. You should only hurt people who are trying to hurt you or your friends. And you should always ask for consent when looking under other people's clothing. (laughs) (laughs) I have seen Paxton do heroic things save lives and he has agreed to help us save the world from bad people i have not seen him do any bad things i don't know this frith guy but he sounds like a completely different person than paxton i've changed a lot since i was made i learned how to turn into animals i learned magic spells I learned how to talk to plants, and I'm even getting married. And I kiss the cactus in a pot (laughs) sitting beside me, and little (laughs) cactus spines embed themselves in my little cloth face. (laughs) If (laughs) If Paxton was ever frith, I don't think he's frith anymore. I think Paxton's changed too. Thank you. I love you. Well, so, all right. Now, Brandon, I want you to roll a persuasion check with advantage. Okay. Because that was very well done. Uh, what is my charisma score? I think it's pretty dismal. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> persuasion is minus one. I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, you're looking to beat a 12. Uh, I got... Oh. I got an 11. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so I may, you, I, you, it seems like you might have lost him on that, on the kissing the cactus thing at the end. That, he was with you right up until you, right up until you, you kissed the cactus. And that was, that kind of put him over the edge. And, <laughs> Why is it minus one? <laughs> and <laughs> Reddle 4, he, uh, he goes, uh, great. Yes. Okay. Very well. We will now take a short recess. Uh, defenders, if you wish to submit any evidence or witnesses, now would be the time. And he pounds something on top of the high table that he's at, and the crowd stands to rise, and the, people start filtering out. What was the name of the guard who wanted to be a witness? So it was General Halth Rogers. Okay, so we got Halth. Do we have anyone else who was in the in the room <laughs> who was okay with Paxton? Well, you do see one guy. Um, he he comes walking over to you, and he is quite flamboyantly dressed. Uh, he's wearing like this huge hat with all sorts of like feathers coming out of it. Uh, like he's got like this coat that's like very vibrant and festive, and all this stuff. And he he comes up to you, and he says, "Hello, I am Dylan Fla. I've come to stop this sham trial." <laughs> Hi, I'm Lumpen. Hello. This is Lumpen. I have met another of your kind. I am here to represent Pakistan. Do you know this guy? Of course. Am I in the same area as all this, or am I being held like in a completely different spot? No, you're standing like okay. in the direct center of the room. Paxton, do you know this guy? And, and, he, and he, he waves at you, Paxton, and he, and he says, Of course, of course, he remembers me. Insight check. Do I know this guy? Because I feel like I don't. <laughs> uh, roll a roll a history check for me, Paxton. History check. 
That's an eight. Okay, uh, maybe vaguely familiar. He says, Paxan, please. I, I'm a Vrasacha from the secret place. Yeah? You'll remember the secret place, Pakistan. <laughs> we'll just stop the, the guy who was trying to, to, to destroy the, the thing. Stopped the guy who was trying to destroy the thing. Yeah, I do remember he was digging. He was digging in the ground. And then he tried to escape in a boat. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, I was, I was a Rasacha. Yeah, n- nice to meet you. De La Fleur, is that what you said? Dylan Fly, and we have met before. Yeah, yeah. How how you been? I'm very good. <clears throat> I'm here to stop the sham trial. How how do you plan on doing that? By coming to your defense. <laughs> the side of Hoxton is such a hero. <laughs> well, welcome to my legal team, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to be a witness? Yes. And so he confidently comes forward up to Brennell Four, who has been watching these things, and just with a with a hand, his hand is just kind of resting, or his arms resting on the table, and he's just kind of supporting his hand, his face with his hand. He looks very tired of the, what's happening right now. Very well. You wish to be a witness. And General Rogers, did you say that you you also wish to be a witness? I'm leading him up, or the general up uh, by the hand. Yeah, and so Half Half looks up at him and he says, uh, "Yes, High Consul. I uh, there's certain things that have happened that have made me change my opinion on Paxton." Uh, do I get to be a witness for myself or answer any questions or anything, or is it one of those situations where I can't be trusted? Half at this point he says, "High Consul, I you know me. I have faithfully served the city for for several years now, and." I believe that the proceedings would be much more fair and much more respected if Paxton was able to represent himself, possibly under a zone of truth. Paxton's nodding vigorously. Brennelvor seems to kind of consider this. He rubs his rubs his chin. He strokes his mustache a little bit, and he goes, "I, hmm, I will take it into consideration. For for now, you will both be allowed as witnesses." Can Lumpen be a witness? The defenders may not act as witnesses, but you will get a chance to interrogate every witness. Okay. Wumpen raises his hand and asks, what does interrogate mean? Definitely not that. Anything involving an... any? No. No. Stop it. Stop it. Paxton Paxton looks out at the crowd in the courtroom, and he's looking to see if Atolf is there. No, Atolf is not there, surprisingly. Paxton's wondering what happened to Atolf after, uh, after Paxton got to... Uh, Kidnapped, cleric napped, whatever. Yeah, he and you know D and D and Zenferer. I can't remember what what the, the other guy's name, but it, none of them have been seen since since you were captured. Hmm. hmm. Probably just went on to the Iron Empire without us. But uh, do we want him? It's probably for the best. It's an internal monologue. Yeah, I see. <laughs> so they are nowhere to be seen and don't seem to be here. Yeah. So after a short time, the the crowd makes its way back in. the The guards standing at the door, they kind of help shuffle people in, and then they um, they go back to their post. As the crowd is finally brought back in, and they start sitting down, they there's talking amongst themselves. A few you hear somebody laugh and snort, but then as Consul Brennelfor stands up and raises his hand, the murmurings immediately cease. Thank you. We'll now hear from certain witnesses selected by both the accuser and the defenders. On the right of the room is the other high council member sitting, but on the left of the room, uh, there's a, a large stand. A woman approaches it. It's an elven woman wearing sorceress robes. And Paxton, she also looks vaguely familiar to you. Varen approaches her and he says, Greetings. Please introduce yourself to the council. She goes, uh, Hello, my, my name is Haladriona. I'm from the first class four. And then she waits around for a second and turns to see if anyone recognizes the name and, and is met with total silence. And then she looks down and sighs. And Varen says, my lady, have you ever met the accused? She nods. He says, please recall what happened during your last interaction. She says, well, uh, he attempted to smash my head in, but thankfully he 
tripped and he, before he was able to kill me. And Varen says, I see. And, and how did this come about? Why, why was he attacking you? She goes, well, uh, me and the first class four, she looks around again, were attempting to guard the soul jar. Uh, he was attempting to destroy the soul jar. As she says this, there's a loud gasp all throughout the room. Varen continues and says, and I take it, judging from the news reports and by the occasional phantom terrorizing townsfolk, that his efforts were successful. The elf looks down in shame. And she says, they were. He says, no more questions, High Consul. And he, he steps over to the side. Brennelfor turns to the Lumpens and he says, do you have any questions for the witness? I'll let Iron Lumpen start. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lumpen. Uh, hi, hi, Lumpen. What's a soul jar? Um, uh, <laughs> well, it was basically where all the people who died and animals, certain animals who died, it was where their souls would go in the center of the world. And all the souls were contained there until Paxton or Frith or whoever uh, came and destroyed it. Oh, so it's like a, it's like a big cage. Um, well, not really. It was kind of our sacred place where everybody went when they died. Could could they leave? Uh, no, they couldn't. They couldn't leave. That sounds like a cage. Paxton couldn't leave his cage earlier. Paxton couldn't leave his cage? He was in the cage on the way here. Oh. Well, yeah. I. Hmm. And she seems to think about it. And she goes, I guess I never really thought about it that way. But, you know, he did try to attack me. I didn't see that. I'm sorry. What happened to the soul jar? It it, it broke, and they blamed us um, for not defending it well. Oh, that sounds mean. You defended it. Yeah, I I did. I did <laughs> defend it, and and her eyes start to tear up a little bit. So what happened to all the souls inside? They all, I guess, were freed and let out. But some of them were bad people, and. And some of them uh, caused a lot of issues when they came out and were just kind of floating around for a while. Oh, well, that part doesn't sound good. I don't, yeah. I don't think I have any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Lumpen, do you owe your wife any more questions? I have some questions. So has anyone talked to the souls after they got out of the jar? She kind of looks around. She goes, I, I don't think so. Do you think if you were stuck in a jar for a long time and somebody let you out... Would you want to go back in, or would you be happy to be out? I, I, you know what? I guess I'd be happy to be out. It, it did, you know, it did kind of look stuffy in there. And Charles is like, uh, le leading the witness, Your Honor. Lead it, uh, and Counsel Brennaford just kind of looks at him and shakes his head. He says, uh, do you have any more questions for the witness, defenders? Mm. Would you like a hug? Yes. Yes, I would. And she comes down off the stand and gives the little lump in a hug. All right, I need um, whoever wants to to roll a persuasion with advantage. Mine's no better than Which yours. One of us is worse. <laughs> uh, let, let, let's see if you roll a d20. We'll, we'll do that as advantage. Oh, that's a good way to do advantage. Oh. I got uh, it. I got a 14. Hey. So it seems to be uh, the crowd seems a little bit moved by the fact that, you know, this little lumpen came up and hugged the witness and <laughs> and and she actually seems to have changed a few opinions or you guys both seem to have changed a few opinions on what the soul jar represented. She goes and she takes a seat. Next, we zoom forward to see a middle aged and by middle aged, I probably mean in the 300s elven woman. <laughs> and a pristine white robe with a silver diadem on her forehead. She is sitting at the witness stand. Varen has just asked her to introduce herself. She says, My name is Takilda Varvalin, darling, the greatest wizard to ever live. And he says, And you have met the accused before. Indeed. And what happened the last time you met? Well, he, he prevented the robbery, I suppose. And how did he do that? She says, Well, he... They paralyzed the invisible bathroom man, and then they continued to stab him on the ground. Really? He was paralyzed, and they continued to stab him? Yes, but to be fair, there were many times I would have liked to stab that man. And Paxton did try to staunch the bleeding. Varen glares at her and goes, Ah, no! <laughs> no more questions, High Consul. And, he's, and he steps away. 
Uh, Consul Brownfor looks at you, Lumpins, and he says, What say you, defenders? I'll step forward. What's the invisible bathroom man? Well, he was he was a man who came to to steal a bookend. To steal what? A bookend from from the house of a uh, Siegbert. I flip through my gospel of Paxton. It doesn't say anything here about stealing, but I think that's a bad thing, right? Yes, uh, Gunter Gunter is not the most wonderful of people to know. And what what do what do people do in bathrooms? Uh, th- <laughs> darling, I, I think uh, perhaps that is a subject that uh, should be explained to you after the court proceedings. Well, like, what what is an invisible person doing in a bathroom? Um, I I believe that he was there to become invisible so that he could try to steal the bookend when no one was looking. Mm-hmm. In a bathroom where people do private things. Now, Paxton taught me about consent. It is very important, yeah. <laughs> and I don't think that you're supposed to be hiding invisible in a bathroom where people might be doing private things. That is true. So, what exactly was wrong with stopping him? Um, I honestly don't think there was anything wrong with stopping him. Okay. It was a bad man who was trying to do a bad thing. And Paxton tried to help him afterward, right? He did. He tried to stanch the bleeding. What do you think, Lumpen? It sounds like Paxton was helping people from a bad man, and then also he helped the bad man. It sounds like Paxton helped everyone. Yeah. No further questions? And Brennell 4 kind of nods at this. All right. Whoever wants to roll with advantage again. Oh, each roll the d20 again? Yep. Let's do it. I got a 18. Oh, I got a 10. Switching dice <laughs> for the next one. So far, you have two successes and one failure. So we'll see if Charles, if the better he does, the DC might go up. Mm-hmm. Next, we see a elderly elven woman in faded green robe, similar to the ones being worn by Varen. Um, and she is sitting at the witness stand. Varen says to her, please introduce yourself. And she goes, my, my name is Zenta. Zenta, please tell us, Zenta, what happened the last time you saw Paxton. Well, uh, I was interrogating him in the prison, and I was asking him things, and asking him about what brought him there, and what, what made him come to the city of two. And uh, anyways, he actually seemed like a pretty nice guy until uh, he broke out of prison a little bit later. All, all I found was this note, and she picks up the note, and, and what did the note say? Well, it says, uh, most sorry, had to go save the world, signed by Tara. And then it says, <laughs> in a different handwriting, and if you find an elf and you're missing a guitar, just know that that guitar was used to save the world, and that is signed by not Tara. <laughs> And Charles says, and this was all that was given as an excuse for breaking out of prison? Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it was. And uh, it didn't seem uh, super, it seemed a little bit suspicious uh, that he would be willing to break out of prison to imitate a high council member and to leave and cause so much chaos and destruction when he left. And Charles nods and he says, thank you, High Cloak Xantha. You can take a seat. Or she goes, well, I, I'm supposed to answer side questions from the other <laughs> side, right? And he goes, uh, oh, uh, yes, I su- suppose so. And he, and he steps over to the side. And Consul Brennafor, he nods over to the Lumpens. I don't know Lumpens going to walk over. What kind of chaos and destruction did he cause that you said on the way out? Uh, well, he put a bunch of gods to sleep, and uh, besides that, uh, he also released a deep druid who had been charged with uh, the murder of several loggers to the south. He put gods to sleep? Wait, are there gods in this world? I thought there were no gods in World 83. Guards. Gods. Gods. Come on. Oh. Come on. Several please. gods. I've got, it's my, uh, it's my city of two accent, all right? I see. I'm walking I'm here. I'm talking here. I'm talking here. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. All right. So, so they went to sleep. Yeah, they they put them to sleep. Um, 
and they lied to him and they basically just caused a lot of chaos. And then he seems to have also been running with another two criminals who robbed a local museum. But the the guards woke up, right? Was the guitar in question from the museum? Yeah, they robbed a guitar. But the note said that the only reason that they were leaving the prison and using a guitar was to save the world. Is that not a a good thing to do? Yeah, I suppose, but uh if you can't break out of no prison further and the questions. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> she she very grumpily, she kinda of huffs up and pulls up her cloak and kind of stalks over to the side. So you guys can roll with advantage because you're doing it together. <laughs> Oof, come on, new dice. Ooh, again, 18. Oh. oh, 17. I got one. Okay. This dice goes in the dice jail. <laughs> so next up, we see this ridiculous looking, what appears to be a bard, and he is sitting at the witness stand. And because he was a witness submitted by you, that you guys actually get to ask the first questions. And his name is Dylan Fleur. Dylan Fleur. Who are you? I was Dylan Fla, the Vard, <laughs> the Vard Versata. And what is your relationship to Paxton? We are best friends. <laughs> Can you tell us why you think he's a good guy? Paxton is a hero. He was a of the world, killing us doppelgangers, and he was, he was trying to destroy the world. Buckton stopped him in a bot. I look over at the court reporter <laughs> and say, did you get all that? <laughs> you see a lady with a, a, a scribe's tablet over there, and she's transcribing stuff on her own tablet, and but then there's also like a magical feather pen next to her, also like doing duplicates, I mean, her and the feather pen kind of look at each other, and then they look at you, and they and they both seem to kind of shake, shake their heads at the same time. Could you try that again in a different accent? <laughs> <laughs> what accent? <laughs> I think I got that you were he was fighting doppelgangers. Yes. And from my experience. The doppelgangers are up to no good. Ah, sabotage the hard world. Trying to save the world. No, no, the doppelgangers were trying to destroy the world. The doppelgangers were trying to destroy the world. Yes. And Paxton helped to stop them. Yes. Lumpen, do you have any questions? That seems pretty simple to me. Yeah, do you think Paxton's bad in any way? Nah, Paxton is a hero. <laughs> I think so, too. All right, your turn. And I point at Charles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Baron Bluefire, he he steps up and he says, thank you. So, uh, Dylan Floor, was it? Yes. Yeah, so I I was looking into you during, during the break, and uh, I see that you have a record of your own. Is that correct? Uh, I don't, I don't know what to man. I see here it says uh, several times charged for public indecency. Those are false charges. Those are false charges. I asked to completely fabricate. Yes, yes, and and where were you? Where were you working at the at the time when all this happened with Paxton? And Dylan Flora kind of sniffs and he goes. Agaza. Say that one more time. Agaza. You you can't say. Yes. You so you can't even tell us where all this where all this happened at. You can't even say anything about it. No. It has no more questions. I console, and he he steps aside. I need you guys to roll. Uh, I think this was uh, this time is not going to be with advantage. This is just a base roll. No. I tell you. Okay. Oh, that was a five. Oh. Yeah. So uh, the <laughs> the crowd seems to kind of murmur amongst themselves after after that whole display. They don't seem very impressed with this bard. I put my hand in the air. 
What does public indecency mean? <laughs> Health, uh, he, he, he pats you down on the shoulder. He goes, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you after. We don't need to talk about it. Okay. I, I, think, he, I think he peed in an alleyway. What's peeing? Okay, that's a... Uh, oh, ooh, wow. All right. <laughs> and so the next witness is called, and it actually is General Houth Rogers. He comes and he stands up and he goes to the witness stand. And the Lumpins are allowed the first questions. You want to start us off? Hi, General. I'm Lumpin. <laughs> Hello. Um, yes, I'm... I, hi, Lumpin. I'm General Houth Rogers. Of the city of two. Do you remember when we were on our way here? I do. Do you remember when all those animals attacked? I do. Not only were they animals, but they were actually deep druids, notorious criminals against the city of two and the great forest. Do you remember what Paxton did when they attacked? Paxton heroically saved our caravan. He could have run, but he did not. Instead, he stayed and he fought and he healed those who needed it. And he even actually brought back to life um, Lieutenant Mistilla and Private Garrus. Hey, that's like the opposite of killing someone. Oh, yes. He, he actually saved all of us, brought people back to life, and he himself was willing to resubmit to capture afterwards. That sounds nice. Yes. Hey, you called them deep druids. Wasn't that the, wasn't that the people that the other lady said that Paxton let go? It was indeed. He uh, he brought back. Uh, he he killed many of those who were attacking us, and he fought and protected us from them. Wow! So it's it's like it balances out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. I mean, I could, I, I, you could say that. Uh, I did say that. At the very least, <laughs> he does not seem he does not seem to be some insane criminal to me. He seems to be a man who is trying to do the right things. Lumpen, do you have any other questions? Can you tell us why you decided that the right thing to do was to stand up in Paxton's defense? Because, uh, you know, when I first met Frith or Paxton, I, I, I'll be honest that I had a lot of um, dark h- hatred towards him for just from what I'd heard him to be, but... You know, after the last few weeks, I, I no longer have that opinion. After seeing him heroically save my men and be willing to resubmit to capture, you know, that, it, that seems to be someone who is, is trying to right wrongs and is trying to bring peace. When you think of Paxton, the Paxton that you know, do you think that he is the same guy that Frith was? From what I know of Frith, he does not seem to be anything like him. Thank you. Would you like a hug? I'm fine for now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me know. Will do. And so he he kind of shakes his shoulders a little bit uncomfortably. But then Varen Bluefire, he steps up, his green cloak swirling around him as he as he makes his way forward. General Health, I I'll be honest, I was not expecting to see you to see you up here. And the general kind of lifts his head. How how long have you known uh, Frith Paxton? And the general says, well, um, for about the two weeks that it took to get here. Yes, and uh, you you knew him as a criminal, right? Well, I, I suppose I knew him as he was captured. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you you found him like that. And could it be possible that this was all a long ploy by Frith in order to appease some of his sentencing. General Hal thinks about that for a second. He Objection. says, "Objection! Exceeding <laughs> the witness." <laughs> I'm imagining Hemp and Lumpen just like have this law book, check frantically flipping through it to like random pages. That's what Charles said earlier. <laughs> Once again, Brennell, Brennell Ford just just shakes his head. He says, "That's we d- we don't do that here." <laughs> Okay. And General Howth, he says, I, I don't believe that to be the case. And Charles, or Varen, glares at Howth, and then no more questions. All right, you guys can roll a persuasion with advantage. Okay. Uh, 16. All right. I got to. All my dice to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a success. 
General Health, he goes and sits down and there's actually a pause and you guys aren't sure what's happening or what's going on. But finally, an old human woman with a head covering, she she rises and she comes to the witness stand. Um, She sits down. Charles actually, or Varen goes over and helps her take her seat on the witness stand. It, you can tell that she's very old. There's a pause and and people seem to be looking around kind of confused as to who this lady is. Consul Brennelfor has a very strange expression on his face. After a minute, this lady takes off her head covering and you see a giant scar on her forehead. Varen turns to her and says, Ma'am, please introduce yourself to the council. My name is Beryl. Thank you, Beryl. Beryl, would you mind please introducing who you are to the council? She swallows and she says, I was an observer. There's a huge echo, like, peel, like the crowd is now like very vibrantly chattering amongst themselves. You see Council Brennelfor, he kind of nods his head. Thank you. And tell me, Beryl, how, how do you know Frith? She says, well, I had only met him on, on a few occasions. But I, my truest friend was named Ephnis. And me and Ephnis, uh, we had been close compatriots for uh, years and years, and we had both been cursed by our observer nature to stand out amidst the crowds. Unfortunately, my friend Ephnis was cursed with another affliction, and that she was in love with another observer named Frith. She did what she could to try to lead him towards goodness and lead him towards doing the right things. But in all of those instances, he and she she starts to yellow choke up and she goes, uh, he lied to her and betrayed her. And he he ultimately deceived her into thinking that Consul Brennelfor um was a doppelganger and she was killed um, later on. There's a, a deep quiet over the crowd and she looks over at you, Paxton. She says, I hate him. I hate him with everything I have for what he did to Ephnis and for what he did to all of us. And she looks down and Charles says, uh, no more questions, Your Honor. And he steps away. Council Brennafor looks to the Lumpens. Uh, so wait, is Councillor Brennafor is the one who recused himself, or is it Councillor no, Brennafor the one judging? No, right Council Brennafor is the one judging. Oh. Council Bluefire, uh, Alara Bluefire, Varen's mom. It was her husband who was killed in a cave in by Paxton or by Frith. I see. Yeah, Council Brennafor was the one who was accused of being a doppelganger by Frith, but is now standing in judgment over Paxton. I see. I'm sorry you lost your friend. How does that make you feel now? Very sad um, and tired. After that, I figured I had to find a way to stop all of the madness, and I approached the council, and I, I was able to help them to figure out what was happening. And eventually I went into hiding myself because the observers were being hunted down because of what Frith had done. Um, and I was able to, um, with some help from a wizard, remove my own observer gem. Oh, what is an observer gem? It was a gem that each of us found inside of us um, when we first you know, remember waking up. Each of us had one somewhere on our body. Mine was on my forehead. What happens when it gets taken away? Well, for me, it caused a lot of pain um, and a lot of hurt, but now I no longer feel the compulsory need to bow and meditate. It caused a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. And you said that Paxton used to be an observer too? Um, yes, he did. If he's not an observer anymore, then he must have also gone through the same sort of thing, right? I don't know how he got rid of his gem. Probably some sort of evil magic. Hmm. Have you ever met a doppelganger? She is starting to get a little frustrated, and she says, what, what does that have to do with anything? Well, there are doppelgangers running around, and 
We're supposed to save the world from them. So if you've met one, it would be good to know. I haven't met a doppelganger. See, what do you think, Lumpen? So Frith told you that Council... I'm sorry, not you. He told your friend that Council council member Brellafor was a doppelganger? Yes, and, and she trusted him. And she tried to expose him to prove that he was a doppelganger? Yes. How do you prove that someone's a doppelganger? <sighs> I'm not sure how. I, I believe she tried to use Moonbeam or some other spell to try and expose uh, his true nature, but his true nature is that of an elf. And so she was attacked and was killed in the ensuing battle before she was able to explain why she had done what she'd done. Oh, so, so, she, so she was wrong, and she made a mistake. Based on what Frith had said, yes. Maybe Frith also made a mistake. He made a lot of mistakes. Don't we all make mistakes? Not usually ones that involve the deaths of many innocents. Well, that's true. We can make up for those mistakes. I hope Frith does. At the end of the executioner's sword. Oh. I was about to agree with you, but I don't like that part. Do you know why they thought that there may be a doppelganger pretending to be Brennelfor? Because she thought that Brennelfor was a doppelganger because of what Frith had promised her and told her. He made it sound like it was urgent that she stop Brennelfor and made it sound like she needed to do something. No. Oh. She says, I, I, have, I have nothing more to say. And she crosses her arm. But do you think that Paxton dying would make up for your friend dying when all he wants to do now is save people? What about all the people that he won't be able to save when he's dead? She pauses for a minute and she sighs and unfolds her arms and then she looks at you, Lumpen, and she says, it might not fix what was wrong, but it's a start. Mm. I don't trust Paxton Frith to save anyone. Mm. I think everyone is in danger while he is alive. I'm sorry that you feel that way. Would you like a hug? No. Okay. Council Brown Forrest says, uh, thank you. Um, I, uh, thank you, my lady. I, I know that this puts you in grave danger to expose your true nature and we appreciate what you were willing to do here today. And she nods and she steps down and she's escorted out of the council chambers by a guard. All right, I need you guys to roll with disadvantage on this one. So you guys can both you guys can both roll. Nine. Uh, also nine. Okay. <laughs> so that is a failure. Failure on the opening remarks, a success with Haladriona, and it was a success with Tekilda. Mm-hmm. I believe it was also a success with Zentha. Yep. Yes. And, it, and then it was a failure with Dylan Floor. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then a success with General Rogers, I believe. Yes. Yep. All right. And then it was a failure on Barrel. So I believe it is now four and three. Yeah, I think so. Ooh, it's rough. So after this, Paxton, you yourself are called to the witness stand. Okay. You make your way up and Baron nods to you, Lumpins, because you, you guys are the ones who called for him being a witness. Hi, Paxton. Hi, Lumpin. General Health actually stands up abruptly as Paxton is first called to the witness stand. And he says, Your Honor, consider... What you told me. Brennel for sighs, and then he says, Very well, we will allow Frith to be exposed to a zone of truth. You guys all ready? Mm-hmm. I was so ready. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. 
you make your way up and Frith, Frith, uh, or sorry, not Frith, you're Frith. Uh, very, no, I'm not. Very, <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I was listening back uh, to uh, the episode again of where you guys released that deep druid. Mm-hmm. And as she left, as she left you guys, she said, if you ever encounter the deep druids, just tell them, you know, Alarandra and they'll leave you alone and it'll be fine. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. So I realized that if you had just <laughs> said her name at any point, it would have actually ended, ended the fight. Yeah, but it also would have made me look guilty. Like I'm friends with terrorists. <laughs> So <laughs> that's that's fair. That's very fair. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. I'm I'm gonna be totally <laughs> honest that uh whenever you're mentioning the stuff about um LaFleur and stuff, you know, it plays well into Paxton's whole <laughs> shtick of like, oh, I don't remember, but like I really don't remember <laughs> like anything. No, <laughs> this would have been like episode six or some, or yeah, like something or super like, early. It yeah. was like episode twelve or something, maybe. But it it was back at the Western Research Facility. He was one of the researchers. He was the a bard mm-hmm. and he was um researching bardic magic. And I don't think he ever actually spoke at any point <laughs> during that. And so I just decided to come up with a just a random voice for him. <laughs> All right. So how many times have you actually gone over the last like two hundred whatever episodes? <laughs> Uh, I only, so I've listened to them all the way through twice now, but I've, <laughs> but as I was going preparing a lot of this stuff, I would like go back and be like, okay, what accent did she have? Or like, what description did it give of, of this person and you're, stuff like that? You're into the deep lore. Mm-hmm. That's, that's right. That's right. I'm, I'm a little bummed. I never got to bring up Suspa, the half orc from <laughs> Smite and Bite. I've been waiting for my chance. So. I'm sad I rolled so poorly on my opening remarks. <laughs> <laughs> you guys did good. I feel like you guys have you've done better than I expected. Your arguments have actually been really solid. I taught them well. Yeah. <laughs> This really reminds me of that. being like, like, like in debate in high school because I'm, I'm, like, I'm like trying to take notes. I'm trying to remember certain points. I'm trying to remember to like, uh, you know, to like, like address everything that's been said to the best of my ability. But Iron mm-hmm. Up was also kind of dumb, so I can't do it too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I really enjoyed Iron Lumpen's um, like very innocent and empathetic. Uh, in cross examination, yeah. <laughs> especially the bits about the salt cage. <laughs> I was good. Yeah. 